Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. In a previous episode, I talked about the carbon cycle, and I introduced the concept that carbon exists on Earth in a variety of reservoirs, from limestone to the atmosphere, uh, soils, the living biomass of our planetary biosphere, and things like uh, black shales that contain kerogen, stored organic carbon in sedimentary rock. And of course, limestone, as I said before. And so in this episode, I want to expand on that a little bit and not just talk about the size of the reservoirs, but to actually talk about the fluxes and to talk about what are the different parts of the carbon cycle and how do they interact with each other? Why is it a cycle? What is, what is cyclic about it? You can talk about this in a couple of different ways. The carbon cycle is a, is a big, complicated thing. Uh, but for the purpose of our discussion here, for the purpose of conceptualizing the carbon cycle, it can be useful to break it down into smaller sub-cycles, looking at parts of the system and then looking at how those parts fit together to form the whole. So, for example, you could look at the carbon cycle and think of it only in terms of uh, the terrestrial and marine organic carbon cycle in the crust, in the atmosphere, in the oceans. What forms do carbon take and how long do they spend in those forms? Looking specifically at organic sediments kerogen, fossil fuels, things like that, the living biosphere. You could also think of the carbon cycle as looking at parts of it that are primarily inorganic carbon, the carbon found in limestone, calcium carbonate, for example. And you could think of that as kind of an inorganic carbon cycle. And it's useful to do that. But both of these cycles are actually just part of the whole. They are operating within the same world milieu. And so what I want to talk about in here is what are the different cycles of carbon? How do they operate? On what time scales? The thing to remember, though, with the carbon cycle, it's like, a, it's like a set of Russian dolls in terms of different cycles that operate at different time scales. Let's start with short-term organic carbon cycling. Specifically, what am I mean by that? Because that sounds technical. What I mean by that is basically trees. Photosynthesis from green plants and from plankton in the oceans is a primary driver of where carbon goes on our planet. Oxygenic photosynthesis by green plants and by phytoplankton produces organic carbon. It produces biomass directly by the synthesis of sunlight with CO2 and water in the cellular machinery of plants and algae. The result is the production of organic carbon, basically the biomass of the algae and plant itself. It builds itself. And oxygen is a waste product, which we breathe. On our planet, photosynthesis draws carbon out of the atmosphere. Its primary activity is to take CO2 from air and use it to build solid bodies of plant material. And so oxygenic photosynthesis is a carbon drawdown from the atmosphere by primary producers that use sunlight to reduce carbon dioxide in air to the carbohydrate saccharides of organic matter. The other side of that coin is aerobic respiration. Animals breathe oxygen, fish breathe oxygen, even bacteria that are aerobic need oxygen. They all perform aerobic respiration. You take in organic carbon, carbohydrate, saccharides, basically the organic matter that plants produce as they grow. We take in that as a food supply, a fuel that in our bodies, in our cells, enzymes use that fuel along with oxygen that we take in to chemically, enzymatically burn. It doesn't combust, it's not fire, but it is oxidizing the organic matter back to the carbon dioxide where it came from. So CO2 is removed from the atmosphere by photosynthesis and returned to the atmosphere by aerobic respiration. And to a first approximation on our planet, these two processes pretty much balance each other. So on this planet, consumers, which are animals, zooplankton, decomposing bacteria, they will use oxygen as a fuel for the enzymatic digestion of organic matter back to CO2. They are two sides of the same coin. And on short-term timescales of years to decade, photosynthesis and respiration, the two processes operating on our planet at the same time, basically controls the CO2 concentration within a certain range and has a pretty fast response time because trees and plants grow quickly and they take a lot of carbon out of the air. How much? Well, take a look at this. This is called a Keeling curve, named after the scientist who first popularized this data and showed the world that, in fact, the CO2 concentration of our planet is increasing because of the fossil fuels our civilization burns and that burning produces CO2, which goes directly to the atmosphere. We'll talk about that in a different lecture set. I'm not so much focused right now on this diagram looking at the rise of CO2. I want you to look at the other curve. There's a sine wave curve, an up and down curve, that superimposes over the general trend of CO2 going up. This curve shows every year in the autumn, 
the CO2 concentration goes up. It, le it reaches a maximum, and then it goes back down again, reaching a minimum as summer progresses, and then it goes back up again the next year. What's happening is, in the northern hemisphere of our planet, most of the forests are concentrated. The southern hemisphere of our planet has forests. It has forested land in South America and Africa, but, and in Southeast Asia, but not as much by far as in the northern hemisphere with all the taiga and boreal forests of Siberia and Russia and all the forests of Canada and North America. It adds up. And so the northern hemisphere dominates the CO2 abundance from year to year, from month to month for that matter, of our planet. In autumn, the rate of photosynthesis declines to nothing, essentially, in winter, but decomposition still goes on. Dead leaves that have fallen from the trees, dead materials, plant materials in the soil. Even in winter, that stuff still continues to decay at a slower rate, but the rate of decay and release of CO2 back to the atmosphere far exceeds the rate of photosynthesis, which is essentially next to nothing. Then spring comes. At the top of that curve, those red curves, every one of those wave peaks, that's a springtime. Suddenly, spring comes, the buds open, flowers bloom, trees start growing new leaves, and all of that new growth is coming out of the air. And you'll see the concentration of CO2 is going up by about five or six parts per million, or down about five or six parts per million on an annual basis. From the dead of winter going into late summer, CO2 concentration of our atmosphere drops by about six parts per million. The present concentration of CO2 in air is about 400 parts per million. So that's over a 1% drop in just a few months. And that's because of a world of plants inhaling. And the cycle repeats every year. The uptick on total CO2 is the overlay effect of human activities on it. But the up and down cycle has been around for a very long time. And it is a normal part of short-term carbon cycling on our planet. And over the time scale of years to decades, it is a dominant factor by far over all the other processes that control carbon because they operate over much longer time scales and shuttle around smaller amounts of carbon on an annual basis compared to photosynthesis and respiration. You can represent the dominance of photosynthesis and respiration on what we call a box diagram model. Geochemists and planetary scientists will often use box models to represent natural processes. It's a simplification, but it's sort of a conceptual map showing you the relationships are among different reservoirs and the size of the fluxes going from one to the other. So if we wanted to put together a box diagram of what I've just described so far about the carbon cycle, I could say, I'm gonna put in my initial reservoir of the atmosphere of carbon in our air, which is the source that plants mine, essentially, to build themselves. On our planet currently, the atmosphere contains about 760 gigatons of carbon. Annually, about 60 gigatons of carbon are drawn out of the atmosphere by world photosynthesis, by all the plants and all the plankton on Earth. About 60 gigatons per year. That goes into the biomass of the living biosphere. The total biomass of the biosphere is around 600 gigatons. Photosynthesis brings carbon out of the atmosphere and adds it to the box that represents the biosphere reservoir of carbon. Now, on an annual basis, about 30 gigatons, or about half of photosynthetic drawdown of CO2, about half of that is removed from primary producers by feeding by consumers. Consumer organisms are bacteria, fungi, plants that feed upon dead remains of other plants. Um, and mostly animal. So consumers are a tiny amount of the biosphere, amounting to only about five gigatons. We feed on about 30 gigatons per year, not humans, but all consumers on Earth combined, us down to bacteria. That is respired, obviously. We take in food to respire it. So that 30 gigatons goes back to the atmosphere every year. So photosynthesis brings 60 down, about 30 of that is fed to consumers, uh, and that goes back to the atmosphere. The other 30 actually ends up going to a longer term reservoir. Among the primary producers, the plant biomass of our world, about 30 gigatons a year is just dead biomass that is not directly consumed, but is stored away. It gets buried in soil, it gets covered over by other dead biomass, it piles up. And so by death, plant remains, go into a longer term reservoir than stored away in soil and in marine sediments. And that amounts to a big reservoir. That's about 1,600 gigatons. That's a big reservoir and stuff moves in and out of it a bit slower. And so as you might expect, the flux rate into and out of terrestrial soils and marine sediments is slow, and it is, compared to photosynthesis and respiration. And so now you may be able to start seeing what I mean by the carbon cycle is made up of sub-cycles 
that operate at different time scales. If you're an atom of carbon and you get into soil and marine sediment, you're probably going to stay there longer. You're going to be piled up with other sediment and you're going to spend years, decades, centuries, however long in that soil before cycling back out into the atmosphere or into a plant or something. Whereas if you're a carbon atom in the air, you'll typically get pulled out of the air on a pretty regular basis and put into something else. If it's a plant, then it's cycled right back to the air again fairly soon. If it's a plant that sheds leaves that go into soil, then the carbon is stored in the soil for a long time and stays out of the air for that long time. Carbon cycles within cycles, operating at different time scales all over the planet, all the time, at the same time. The oceans are a little bit different because the land surface can have trees, and the oceans don't have trees. The oceans don't possess life forms that are primary producers that exist as large masses of stored carbon. This doesn't work that way. Unlike the land surface, the marine environment is dominated entirely by primary producers that are either single-celled or minuscule individual phytoplankton that are multicellular. Either way, they're tiny, they're microscopic. With the, sec the exception of some small amount of biomass that is kelp and macroalgae, most of the primary producers in the ocean are phytoplankton. In the oceans, there's a huge amount of biomass in the upper 100 meters or so of the ocean water, which is the photic zone, where light penetrates and photosynthesis can go on. And then as these cells live and die, as they die, they simply sink through the water to the bottom of the ocean. This is called marine snow. It's essentially a continuous rain of dead material, dead plankton, zooplankton or phytoplankton that just sort of constantly sifts down through the water column to the ocean floor. And as it does so, it is decomposed. There are bacteria in the water, and as dead planktonic cells diatoms or other forms of, of phytoplankton sift downward through the dark of the ocean depths. Bacteria are decomposing them. Other zooplankton are attacking them as they fall down and eating parts of them away, respiring that organic matter back to CO2. And so by the time this material reaches the ocean floor, most of it is already decomposed. It turns out that only about 1% of the biomass that grows and exists and lives at the ocean surface is actually stored in sediment at the ocean floor. Most of it, 99% of that biomass, decomposes and is returned, recycled back into ocean water before that stuff ever hits the seafloor sediment. Recycling of marine carbon is actually highly efficient. The carbon is not just deposited and sifted away into sediment wholesale all the time. Most of it is actually returned right back to the ocean chemical environment where it can be taken up by phytoplankton again, or it can return mixing back into the atmosphere. Scientists refer to this process as the marine biological pump. What's happening is photosynthesis, because it only occurs in the photic zone, means all the biomass in the ocean starts at near the surface, and then when it dies, it falls. And so when it dies, it's taking with it all the nutrients that make it up. Think about it. The shallow ocean contains dissolved nutrients that the life there needs to live, needs to take up to live, meaning the nutrient content of surface ocean water is typically fairly low. Most areas of the shallow ocean, the nutrient concentrations are very low. And in fact, you need conditions like that to promote things like coral reefs that require highly clean water with very little in the way of nutrients dissolved in the water. Because when you get dissolved nutrients, that feeds algae. Coral reefs will die if too much pollution essentially of sewage or other forms of nutrition, nutrient compounds get into the water, promoting algal growth, clouds the water, sunlight can't penetrate, and the coral die. So normally, surface ocean water is nutrient limited. It's nutrient poor. Where do the nutrients go? They go down to the depths of the ocean. That is the dead matter of marine snow falling down through the water column, decomposing as it does, being eaten as it does. Only a tiny amount of it finding the bottom of the ocean and staying there. The marine biological pump is the name scientists give to this process because it pumps by gravity nutrients from the surface of the ocean to the ocean depths. It brings nutrients to the deep ocean. Deep ocean water is typically nutrient enriched, but there's no photosynthesis going on to provide primary production down there. So deep ocean water, although nutrient rich, isn't polluted because there's nothing that can grow on it. There's no plants that can grow down there, no, no plankton. Surface ocean water is typically nutrient poor.